Well, hello, everybody, and uh, a big welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you to this LSE event uh, for discussion and celebration of uh, Professor Hartley Dean's new book, Understanding Human Need. Now, in uh, an alternative, in alternative uh, events, we would have been launching and celebrating this book back last May on the LSE campus in person and followed by a proper reception. Um, but at least it's great that modern technology allows us to, to meet here today and, and satisfy at least our, our need for intellectual um, stimulation and discussion, if not our need for social contact, uh, wine and canapes. That will, those will have to wait. Um, Professor Hartley Dean is Emeritus Professor of Social Policy at the London School of Economics. And in a moment, I'm going to hand over the microphone uh, to him and he's going to uh, take about 15 minutes to introduce his um, book. And we are then lucky enough to have um, a fantastic panel of respondents who are each going to take about 10 minutes in turn uh, to give their responses from, from a variety of perspectives. So we are going to hear first from uh, Dr. Tanya Burkhardt, who is Associate Professor of Social Policy at the LSE and Director of the Centre for the Analysis of Social Exclusion. And she's going to uh, reflect on, on Hartley's uh, work uh, in relation to uh, unmet need in social care, in particular an area in which Tanya has done a lot of work uh, in recent years. We're then going to hear from uh, Professor Ian Goff, visiting professor at Case, uh, associate of the Grantham in Research Institute at the LSE and emeritus professor at the University of Bath. Uh, Ian's um, uh, work with uh, Len Doyle on a theory of needs back in the 1970s is still very much celebrated and cited and Ian is going to reflect um, on Hartley's work from that perspective. And finally, we will hear uh, from Professor David Taylor, Emeritus Professor of Social Theory and Social Policy at the University of Brighton. And his uh, perspective that he's gonna to bring to uh, the book is from his seminal work on psychosocial approaches in social policy and issues of relational well-being. So I think we're set up for a, a really uh, stimulating hour and a half. Um, uh, we will have, so we'll have 15 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. So there's gonna be plenty of time, 40 minutes or so for discussion after we've heard from all our speakers and for questions. And I would like to remind you that you can put your questions into the Q&A box and you'll be able to see other people's questions and, and vote them up. Uh, if you would like to hear those ones answered, that would be very helpful to me as chair to see um, how to prioritise if we, if we get a lot of questions. I'd also like to remind everybody that the event is being recorded and uh, barring technical disaster, it will be available uh, later as an LSE podcast. So without further ado, let me hand over to Hartley to introduce his book. Thank you very much indeed. Um, as uh, Kitty has explained, um, this panel discussion comes in lieu of um, a book launch. Um, and having said that, given the passage of time since that was supposed to happen, um, I think some of this discussion is going to you know, necessarily go beyond what's actually in the book. So um, it's, it's not necessarily entirely focused on that particular book. Now, just as a means of self-discipline more than anything else, I've uh, decided to, to use a PowerPoint. And if I can work this, I'm going to uh, now share the screen for that and start the slideshow. Um, now, I can't at the moment. Right. Okay, um, now what I'm going to do is simply to quite briefly introduce uh, the book, briefly explain it, 
but then to outline the approach that I'm seeking to promote for the purposes of this particular discussion, which can be described as uh, the sort of materialist humanist theory of need. Um, and then finally to offer some reflections on the implications for social policy in the current era. Um, under the heading of a, of a humanizing or a rehumanizing policy perspective. So talking about the book, um, this is a second edition. The first edition was published back in 2010 and um, it represented uh, an initial sort of, well, the motivation I think was, was largely to try and transcend some of the contested and, and often quite banal debates that were going on about terms around well-being and welfare and happiness and, and all the rest of it by returning to some of the, the fundamentals of need and of human need. So it ended up examining a, a baffling array of, of competing theories and contrasting perspectives on need um, and sought to sort those by actually uh, making fundamental distinctions between thin conceptions of need as opposed to thick conceptions of need, between top-down theories and, and bottom-up uh, sort of more practical approaches uh, and claims to the for the recognition of needs, and then thinking how all of that is reflected in the outcomes in different kinds of welfare regime. And also sometime is, a, is addressed um, in the book to the translation of needs into rights, given um, my sort of long-standing concern and interest in the uh, whole topic of social rights. So that was what was in the, the first edition, but in this second edition, which is quite a different book in many ways, um, it certainly updates, it elaborates on the first edition, it fills some of the gaps, it brings out hope, greater clarity, um, and in doing so, um, throughout the book, um, it provides a new emphasis, um, focusing on the sort of anthropological and philosophical perspectives to, uh, that can be found in some of the early writings of Karl Marx. Things that were only quite briefly mentioned in the first edition, but which I pull out um, to ask you know, the sort of fundamental question um, of you know, what is human about human need? And that brings us to this notion of Marx's materialist humanist theory of human need. <clears throat> um, something that can be distilled from relatively neglected early writings of his and um, has been done to a certain extent by writers like Agnes Heller, Georgi Marcus, uh, but which I subject to a certain amount of, shall we say, reinterpretation simplification perhaps, um, but um, do not blame I, either Georgi Marcus or Agnes Heller for the way I've tried to take the argument. Now, what this theory does is it equates human need with four radical characteristics that actually define the constitutive essence of our species being, that defines what it is about the human species, about homo sapiens, that separates homo sapiens from earlier hominid species and from all other species in nature. And um, Marx here was drawing on past philosophers, Aristotle, uh, especially Hegel and some of the post hegelian uh, thinkers, but rather than stressing uh, the, the material, um, he was seeking to stress not the spiritual essence of our human species being, but the material essence. What is it that distinguishes the human species? And so those four characteristics that he identifies were consciousness, work, sociality, and human development. Now, starting then with the notion of our shared and individual consciousness as human beings, something born out of what is, is now referred to as a, elsewhere by Harari and others as um, the cognitive revolution in evolutionary terms that came or what, was it 30 or 70 or however ever many thousand years ago with the birth of language, the full development of language of symbolic representation of conceptual forms of, of, of thinking. Um, forms of consciousness which then 
could confer purpose and meaning on what Marx would refer to as our metabolism with nature, which is this sort of unique form of human activity that he identified as, as work. Although very clearly he was not talking about wage labor at that point, he was talking about something more fundamental about what characterizes human activity. It's, it's consciousness, it's purpose, it's, and the meaning it, that it has for the actor. Um, a consciousness which entails um, a unique form of intersubjective awareness on the part of members of the species as to our selfhood, our identity in relation both to the natural world, but also to each other as vulnerable, interdependent beings. Uh, and that's what Marx was meaning by the concept of, of sociality. Um, but I mean, to quote another thing, I mean, Hannah Arendt claims, yes, a life not lived among other humans is not a human life. That is one of the fundamental things. And in particular, and relevance perhaps to what Tanya might be saying, the whole business of, of caring and cooperation as being something fundamental to the human species. And then finally, thinking about what consciousness enables is um, it permits uh, a unique process of human development. The whole reality that human beings uniquely in nature make their own history. We are capable of making history and of changing our society and, and the world around us. So if we are going to think about this humanizing policy perspective, um, let it be said first of all that if we are creating our own history, um, we have not necessarily done that terribly well. Um, rather than promoting care and uh, cooperation, human history is full of violence, of competition, and apart from anything else, we have been wrecking the planet. Um, so if one's thinking, particularly as Marx went on to do, is to contemplate the consequences of capitalism, particular effects on, for example, the commodification of work, of, of labor power, the commodification of certain forms of, of um, care provision. Um, so if we're thinking about a, a, a humanizing or rehumanizing policy uh, perspective uh, of a response, Rehumanizing is something more than simply decommodifying. We're accustomed in social polity to the concept of decommodification. Um, but to actually rehumanize is perhaps a different perspective. It has different um, connotations. And if we are responding to dehumanizing processes that alienate, that estrange people from their essential humanity, that inhibit, individual fulfillment on the one hand, but also our shared human development. Um, here, this concept of dehumanization captures processes associated with, with poverty, with inequalities, with disadvantage, with social injustices, um, across that sort of panoply of, of forms of dehumanizing um, processes. And, and here, I mean, I draw particularly on feminist philosopher um, Marie Makola and the way that she coins the understanding of uh, dehumanization. Um, but a response would therefore ensure that um, social, cultural, educational institutions um, should effectively nourish human consciousness as a foundation for a fully human uh, existence. Um, resonance here, some will see with, with Paolo Freire and his notion of what an alternative form of education might be, though we are thinking beyond necessarily just formal institutions, but all the informal institutions that are, are associated with the way in which we, our consciousness is constructed. Um, which is thinking about a, a, our need and our right to independent thinking as that unfolds in the course of a life course. We are also thinking about how we might ensure that social and economic policies 
recognized and facilitated all those forms of, of purposeful human activity. Um, whether they be materially productive, socially reproductive, culturally creative, politically constructive. In other words, all the, the, the valuable things that people do. This is what human beings um, do for themselves. This is what is meant by work in this particular um, context. So once again, we're thinking about a need, a right to activity, to creativity. And then if we're thinking about the things that one would want to ensure in a, de in a rehumanizing process or perspective, thinking about the ways in which our social security systems, our health and social care provision can universally support and inclusively extend the realization of human sociality, um, building on the principles of, of respectful human interdependence at a variety of levels, at the intimate, the local, the global, recognizing that uh, the needs that we share, we share with, with not just loved ones and neighbors, but with potentially with distant strangers. In other words, you know, the need and the right to care and to be cared for. So I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but um, I haven't wanted to, I wanted to use my time as efficiently as possible. But finally, um, What I'm suggesting goes perhaps beyond, for example, Nancy Fraser's sort of celebrated notion of a, of a politics of needs interpretation um, towards something that would amount perhaps to a politics of species awareness uh, by which to you know, confront the crises that we currently face as a species. And certainly in the immediate terms, we need to rescue our species from extinction by healing the rift in our metabolism with nature. Um, the notion of the, uh, of the metabolic rift is something which had been foreseen and was written about by Marx, intriguingly. It's not all often recognized, but Marx could see how various forms of human activities were indeed dis degrading um, our species lived environment. And we can see that very clearly, I'm, I'm hoping and expecting, fully expecting that um, Ian is going to have things to say about the climate emergency. But even if one thinks of something like the coronavirus uh, pandemic, we can see the way in which it is various forms of human activity that have permitted um, uh, viruses to jump between species and, and, and so forth. Um, so at, at that level, this is, is very relevant to our notion of our species awareness and, and where uh, policy processes can go. And certainly in the longer term, we need better to realize our capacity as a species for purposeful creativity, universal sociality, and the very way in which we are indeed making history. So finally, a question for discussion. Um, is this just utopian banality? Um, or is it in, does it constitute in any way a meaningful way to reframe our understanding of human need? Like uh, an exam question, discuss. I'll leave it there. Great, many thanks Hartley. Um, setting us an exam question uh, to think about that perhaps we can come back to in the, in the Q&A if our uh, panelists aren't gonna address it head on in their responses. Like an exam, I don't think you gave it to them in advance, so it might be challenging. Um, so let, let me hand over now to, to Tanya, first of all, uh, to give her response. Thank you very much. Well, my response is that it is very definitely a meaningful reframing, and I hope that that brief answer will be sufficient to get me a distinction. Um, but um, having, I hope directly answered the question. Um, I want to take a step back and um, offer a few remarks from my own perspective um, on Hartley's very uh, rich and thought provoking book. Just before I do, I wanted to say and acknowledge that for all of us, this isn't the setting in which we would have chosen to have this celebration and engagement with Hartley's book. Uh, indeed, one of the things that Hartley's book stresses is the relatedness and interdependence of 
human beings. And I think we've all experienced during the pandemic just how disrupted that has been, in particular in relation to beginnings and endings. And luckily in this case, we're not talking about life and death, but we are talking about a, a beginning in the sense of a launch of a book, and also in one sense an ending in so far as this event was originally intended to mark, I think, Hartley's retirement from the social policy department. Luckily, I think there will be future opportunities in which both the conversation around this book and celebrating um, Hartley's long-standing contribution to the department can be taken up and, and celebrated again when we can once again uh, meet in person. But turning now to Hartley's book, there's much in it that I haven't yet digested and it will repay certainly several more readings. Uh, but even on a first reading, there are some important insights which have connected with me uh, on a subject that I've been thinking about in my own work in relation to needs and unmet needs amongst elderly people uh, who may be eligible or not eligible for support through adult social care services. And I'll I just want to make a few remarks about how some of the reframing that Hartley has offered of the concept of need could be applied in this context. And I hope that that will in fact illustrate precisely the point that Hartley was um, ended with, with his exam question, that this is certainly not utopian banality, but absolutely does help us to see where we may be going wrong in some very applied areas of social policy. So the dominant understanding of need in relation to fra frail elderly people is currently framed in terms of physical and mental functions and is almost entirely commodified. So you've got arthritis, right, you need an adapted tin opener or something like that, a, a, a particular good that will address that particular physical functioning. You've got a tendency to fall, will install a grab rail in your house. Or even you can't remember which days to take your pills, will supply you with a little box labelled with days of the week with the right pills in. And if you're like, lucky, a telecare phone call to remind you to open the right box on the right day. And the goal of all of this is, is so-called independent living. But if we deconstruct what independent living means, it's basically enabling you to continue to operate as an active consumer. As a last resort, where there's no commodity that quite seems to satisfy the need thus defined, uh, an assistant, a carer may be provided for a specified number of minutes a day. For example, a 15 minute visit uh, per day uh, for a medication check. But that person, that paid carer, who's going to be dashing from job to job to fit in the number that they've been assigned for the day, paid at or below the minimum wage, probably on a zero hours contract, one in three of the frontline carers are on a, a zero hours contract, is clearly only going to be, offer, be able to offer a very commodified form of labor, a commodified form of care. Now, recently there's been a growing awareness of the problem of unmet need amongst elderly people, but of course it's understood as unmet need for goods and services because the underlying concept of need is a need for goods and services. So at our launch of the social policies and distributional outcomes program uh, a couple of weeks ago, we included the statistic that two out of five people aged 65 or over living in the most deprived neighborhoods in England had an unmet need for at least one activity of, of daily living, for help with at least one activity of daily living. And that is shocking enough as a statistic, two out of five in the most deprived areas. But because that concept of need that underlies that statistic is essentially a commodified one, so too is the definition of unmet need. It refers to that lack of commodities and services. And that's way too narrow a concept of need. In other words, the actual scale of unmet need is far higher than that statistic indicates. 
as we can see if we contrast it with the concept of need and unmet need implied by the radical humanist understanding of need in Hartley's book. So turning then to the four characteristics um, that Hartley outlined in his um, introduction and which are explained much more fully in the book and rethinking what need and unmet need amongst elderly people would look like if we applied that understanding of need, I think we come to some very interesting conclusions. So first, sociality and interdependence. This points to the fact that a person's need is not in fact for independence or independent living as it's been defined, but is inherently interdependent and social. As Hartley says, um, uh, the realization of a good life is fulfilled through social relations of care and caring. So a need for connectedness to care and to be cared for is not met either by technology nor by an organization of care, care services, that militates against the formation of relationships between uh, paid carers and the people they care, care for. Uh, with the extraordinarily high turnover and insecure employment that dominates that sector. If we take Hartley's conception of need seriously, it implies as a minimum, looking jointly at the needs of dyads, of carers and cared for together, whether that's a paid carer or an unpaid carer for that matter, and potentially looking at wider networks of kin and community as well, and organizing services and support in such a way as to support both of those members or all of those members of that uh, kinship group. Second key feature that Hartley draws our attention to is um, work or purposeful human activity. And Hartley puts recognition of care work centrally to his definition of, of that sense of work as he outlined. And it seems to me that according care that status rather than relying on market value or exchange value is a crucial step to addressing the chronic undervaluing of social care in our welfare state as a whole. And we've seen hints of that possibility, haven't we, uh, during the pandemic with the sudden realization that key workers is a non-overlapping set with highly paid workers. And that actually the people we really rely on the people whose the value of their work is really highest when push comes to shove is a very different set of people than the people who are rewarded through the market. But as well as the caring work, the purposeful human activity, I would argue, is no less central to the needs of elderly people themselves. There's growing evidence of the importance of having meaning in life uh, for healthy aging, seen as a central component of healthy aging now. And indeed, it's been identified by older people themselves in various participatory exercises as a valued capability. And we can see the consequences of when this need is not met. So for example, research by Ipses Murray on unmet need reported one respondent who put it very starkly indeed. She said, you don't cope, you exist. You just exist. It's an existence. I'll tell you what you think. I consider this a house, a coffin with a door. So her need for survival was being met, but not her need to be human. Her need for purposeful activity, her need for sociality were entirely overlooked. So for reasons of time, I'll take the third and fourth um, essences uh, and uh, aspects of need together. That is uh, consciousness or critical autonomy, as I might call it, the ability to, to reflect on a situation and act to change it, and involvement in historical development, including bottom-up challenges to the definition of need and how uh, those needs might be met. So understanding these as dimensions of, of need, um, we can see that a focus on activities of daily living, things like can openers and grab rails and boxes, is really not sufficient. Bottom up challenges to the conceptualization of need have so far come mainly from the disability movement, um, from younger disabled people in particular, as a result of very active consciousness raising about disability rights 
uh, about the social model of disability and so on. And that's had some considerable success um, for younger disabled people, especially uh, people with learning disabilities in the form, for example, of deinstitutionalization uh, and the nothing about us without us mantra and so on. It so far had, I would argue, relatively little impact on the organization of care for and by older people who continue to be treated in the main as passive grateful recipients of whatever package of services the algorithm turns out that they're entitled to or fobbed off with um, choice between one inadequate package of services and another. In short, the dominant conception of need in social care, <coughs> I've argued, leads to an idea of unmet need defined by a lack of goods and services and met by those services plus commodified labour. Whilst Hartley's radical humanist understanding of needs leads to an idea of unmet need as defined by social structures that lead to misrecognition of elderly people, atomization and loneliness, and the exploitation of both paid and unpaid carers. So just finally to conclude um, by taking a step back and reflecting on Hartley's book as a contribution to social policy as an academic endeavor. A skeptical, skeptical reviewer uh, described an early manuscript of mine many years ago as relentlessly empirical. Um, and at the time I was a bit perplexed about that critique and I'd assumed social policy was all about empirical evidence. Indeed, that's what had drawn me to it as a subject. But increasingly as the years have unfolded, I've come to understand better, I think, what that reviewer meant. Sometimes people like me are so busy producing the evidence, churning out the numbers, the statistics about the levels of unmet need, for example, that we forget to step back and consider what it's all evidence for. What's the point of all of these uh, statistics that we produce? Now Hartley says in chapter one, the understanding of needs is critical to an understanding of what it means to be human. And I think that really goes to the heart of the matter. And Hartley's book stands in the best tradition of that more reflective and I think enduring social policy, which seeks to question and to clarify what it's all about. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, Hartley, I will give you, uh, we're gonna hear from all the speakers and then I'll, I'll give you some time if you want to reflect on anything that comes up before we open uh, yeah. to the Q&A. Uh, so let me hand over now to, to Ian Goff. <clears throat> Thanks very much, it's very good to be here with you all and to listen to those uh, presentations. Uh, Tanya's was very powerful. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yes, th this is an important book for, t for, t for two reasons. First of all, it's important to start to take needs seriously. It's almost impossible to discuss any issue in social policy without using the word need, as, as Tanya's just uh, illustrated. Um, so it's good to have the book republished after 10 years. But it's especially welcome because it's, uh, it goes beyond a, a mere revision, as, uh, as Hartley said, um, because it puts forward um, a, a materialist humanist theory or perspective on need, drawing on the early Marx's writings on uh, human species. And I found that very, very productive. Um, it took me back to 1968 when we started reading Capital in Manchester. All those years ago. <clears throat> we also read some early Marx as well. And uh, Georgi Marcus's framework, which you, you use, Hartley, is uh, the four species characteristics, consciousness, work, sociality, and historical dynamism. That's, that's, very, um, that's just, it's very convincing to me. And I th it convinced me that um, we have here an alternative framework for thinking about needs, other than the two dominant frameworks, I think, so far, which have been Aristotle, uh, for example, um, Martha Nussbaum, and Kant. And ours, our book on a theory of human need was influenced by Kant. Um, however, I still want to argue that the, for the theory which we developed all those years ago, though not in the 70s, the book came out in 1991. Um, uh, so it's more recent than that. Um, and uh, 
I think, as I say, it is actually a materialist humanist theory of human need. Anyway, the book with, with Len Doyle, um, which came out, a, a Theory of Human Need, in 1991, put forward um, a, a universal and an objective definition of human need. The whole book was motivated to get round problems of moral relativism, which we argued left us in a, a moral quagmire <coughs> when uh, difficult decisions had to be made. So we wanted to put forward a theory which was universal and objective, and the, the three core elements here were the notion of social participation, which is often overlooked, uh, which itself then required a need for survival and health, I mean beyond survival, good health, and autonomy and critical, or, uh, which we later elaborated as critical autonomy. So we've got participation, um, health and autonomy as universal human needs for all people at all times. That's the human, humanist uh, part of the, of the theory. Um, these provide the preconditions for pe humans to act and to be uh, and to participate in whatever uh, social arrangement they, they find themselves in. And so it's a eudaimonic approach, it's not a, a hedonic approach, it, it's, it's looking at um, the ability of people to, to perform, to function in, in society. And it has parallels with uh, eudaimonic psychology, but not so much with hedonic psychology. So that was the, the gist of the, the idea. It's quite close to Martha Nussbaum's notion of capabilities, but not Amartya Sen's. Uh, and uh, she identifies as her three core um, functioning capabilities, if I remember the language. Um, practical reason, bodily integrity and affiliation. And that's very close to autonomy, health and participation. It's also quite close to the ideas of consciousness, work and activity and sociality, I think. So there's, there's areas of agreement here. What are the core humanist elements of need? Um, we then go on to develop this and, and indicate uh, in intermediate needs um, which uh, can contribute to these basic needs. But the crucial further distinction in our theory is that the needs are, are distinct from need satisfiers. And, and Hartley, doesn't, you don't really mention that much in, in your book. I think this is absolutely crucial. There are millions and millions of need satisfiers. They're changing all the time. They vary by culture and context and time. Uh, and uh, to identify need satisfiers is a very different operation to identify human, common human needs. And we go on in the last chapter of the book, and I've tried to develop this since, um, to suggest a framework within which we can have collective negotiation of satisfiers within any particular context. We say it must bring together um, codified knowledge of experts, and the experiential knowledge of people in where, where, whatever situation we're talking about. And I've recently been very interested in the development of citizens' assemblies here, because um, in the UK and Ireland and France, um, concern to, to work out um, what, what are the requirements for reaching net zero or for very much reducing and dangerous emissions in modern societies. Um, and these citizens' assemblies, formed of a, a, a random but representative group of people, 100 or 150, um, uh, then through nine months of negotiation, this is a big operation, uh, come up with a consensual list of, policy, of, of policies. Uh, and uh, it is quite remarkable, I think, how these have functioned, uh, and they've they've included, of course, a, a good number of people who were pretty sceptical about climate change at the start of the of the, of the assembly. So, um, I I think the strength of this approach is that it provides a universal moral foundation, which can avoid some of the problems of moral relativism, um, and can pr provide a core feature of struggles for justice. 
um, and later on in terms of rights. There's a clear distinction, in other words, between needs and wants, but I think we all share that. Um, and there's a requirement for generalizability. Need satisfiers and institutions can be generalized to all people. If a particular need satisfier, like an SUV, can't be generalized to nine billion people on the planet, it isn't a need satisfier. I think that notion of, of generalizability is very important. Um, and this means we can start thinking about the needs of um, future generations, needs over time. Um, because the argument is these will be pretty much the same as we are now until we start to uh, change genetically, um, which is not very likely in the near future. Also in this approach there's an idea of sufficiency. Um, we, can, we can start thinking creatively about what is a sufficient level of living uh, and what is excessive to that. And I think it can also pro provide a, a basis for a new theory of value. Um, and uh, Tanya's mentioned that when we're talking about what is valued in society, um, clearly the present uh, economic theories of value are crazy and stupid. Uh, a hedge fund manager is valued much more than a care worker. Um, and I believe that the only way we're going to get some some agreement on an alternative theory of value is through some notion of human needs. So it's very important from that point of view. Lastly, it's very important because we're now into the Anthropocene, the period when humans are uh, actually affecting the geology, uh, the climate, and the ecosystems of the planet. Um, and of course, we're part of that ecosystem. And, and so we're, we're there's in a sense a new materiality which we now face, which we didn't before. Um, there's a new uh, harsher limits on what we can do. As well as the moral arguments for meeting needs might actually have to be scaled down if the planetary boundaries are, are really restricting um, universal need satisfaction on a moral ground. It's a kind of force majeure we're, we're facing now. And that itself I think um, requires a clearer notion of need so we can start thinking about what activities and institutions and goods and services and all the rest of it are, are required, are necessities um, rather than uh, luxuries or riches. And so um, uh, I think it enables us not only to define flaws, we can all think about what, what are the basic needs uh, and in terms of act, not just commodities and things, but activities and relationships that people need. But we can start thinking about ceilings as well. Floors require ceilings because if we're in a, a constrained world, uh, we can't permit, um, you know, car, high carbon luxury, as luxury consumption to continue. Some ways have to be found of restraining that um, in order to ensure we have a just transition um, to a, a low carbon, zero carbon world and not an unjust transition. So I, I think uh, I think we probably all agree that taking needs seriously is critical to any successful route out of the present global predicament we face. Um, the debates still are on how we actually define needs and, and uh, operationalize them. I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much, Ian, and apologies for uh, misreading my notes so badly. Uh, the first, your your article with Len Doyle was published in 1984, so it wasn't I wasn't so That's far off, but was, yes. but I was still I was I was out. Um, okay, now let me pass over now to to David Taylor for his his reflections. Great, thank you very much. Um, Published in 1984 in Critical Social Policy, I remember you. Um, anyway, uh, firstly, uh, I wanted to say thanks to Hartley for the revised edition of the book. Um, it's obviously an incredibly careful and thorough exposition of, of human need, and um, certainly hope it enjoys the success it deserves. I, I find um, pretty much everything that Hartley says in relation to his theory 
um, convincing and um, I don't particularly want to um, challenge it, but I do want to suggest that um, there's something else that we need to explore, which is the uh, additional kind of missing element, as I see it really, which is an understanding of the psychological dimension of human well-being as a constituent of human need. Um, and I think, Hartley, you've given us a, a very full social account of need, and just as Ian and, and Len did, uh, um, although sli both slightly different, um, and I don't, there's nothing I disagree with in that respect as a social theory of need. What I want to question, though, is the claim um, in the new book that, that Marx's dictum that human essence lies in the ensemble of human relations justifies the conclusion that human need and relational well-being may regard it as effectively coterminous. And uh, Hartley, you and I have discussed this before. And um, apologies if I misrepresent your view, I'm sure you'll tell me if I do, but I believe you feel that human well-being can be incorporated within a view of needs based in social relations. And it, it, it's my view that a, a psychosocial uh, approach to well-being is necessary and would yield an additional emphasis in a radical ethics and politics. I don't believe that the psychological dimension of well-being can simply be incorporated or read off or taken for granted from a purely social interpretation of need, no matter how fully developed. So to be specific, I'm referring to what I've called the inter and intra-subjective dimension of well-being. And that for me entails a fully psychosocial relational understanding of well-being. Um, and I've argued elsewhere that no that having needs met, no matter how thickly defined, is not the same thing as having a positive sense of well-being. Um, this, of course, is, as Hartley said, uh, as you said yourself, Hartley, this has got nothing to do with happiness. Um, uh, in fact, quite the opposite, really. Um, so Hartley set out how many scholars see uh, relationality as foundational for the human subject, and I completely endorse this. But I suggest that implies an expanded set of concepts which deal with the psychosocial constitution of the subject. Um, I don't think that the difference here between need and relational well-being is just a case of semantics. Um, when um, the constituents of a theory, a thick theory of social need, as, as Hartley's presented it, are set out, they tend to focus around external and cognitive needs, such as nourishment of human consciousness, democratized social learning, education, purposeful human care and work, and, and often communication. As I've said, I endorse these completely as constituents of a radical needs-based ethics. However, do they catch the importance of psychological balance and integrity, the struggle to be whole, which I've argued are the core, at the core of subjective well-being. I'm not convinced that they necessarily do. So how would a social theory of needs deal with psychological trauma, for example, or issues of self-care and self-harm? Social learning, education and communication might be necessary, but they're not sufficient to ensure good subjective well-being. Just think how extensive education and knowledge and clear communication fail to deal with mental health problems of self-care and harm, which clearly run deep and require what I would call relational interpretive interventions. Nor do they guarantee psychological stability and personal integrity in and of themselves. Critical reason, higher autonomy and learning and awareness are not sufficient to account for the struggle for internal psychological balance and do not explain how experience is embedded in the subconscious. Nor can they explain the individual's struggle to live a meaningful life and deal with the intra-subjective relations between the self and its objects, its projections, its self-dialogues. As Judith Butler has put it, the self is always vulnerable to being undone. The process of subject building and positive well-being is, is a fragile one, from this perspective and needs the psychosocial conditions that support human personal development. The struggle for personal integrity, internal and intersubjective balance are an important dimension of human needs and personal well-being. And I guess my question really, and it's a question because I'm not sure about the answer to this, can this dimension be incorporated into a social theory of needs and possibly, and Hartley might well tell us, yes, 
but I, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, I think it would require a very thick conception of human de uh, needs. Um, but I worry that focusing solely on the concept of needs as the basis for a radical ethics risks neglecting the very foundational relational basis of human well-being. When we come to a radical politics that flows from this approach, we would need to make sure it supports the conditions for human psychological flourishing, as well as the conditions for individual and social welfare. Indeed, from a psychosocial point of view, the two can't really be separated in my opinion. So I believe that we need a stronger focus in, in an approach such as this, that we need a stronger focus on inter and intra subjectivities and how the foundational relationships of psychological balance and integrity could be supported in a radical humanist ethics and politics. To some extent, it is a debate about the relationship between need and well-being, but rather than argue about the primacy of either concept, I'm suggesting that a radical ethics and politics certainly needs to focus on meeting human need and subjective well-being together. And this has to be confronted with a recognition of the foundational nature of inter and intra-subjective relationships, as well as social relationships. And then if we consider, I mean, several people have obviously and not surprisingly referred to it. If we consider the current time with its massive social and personal challenges um, brought about by the pandemic and the underlying inequalities and traumas it exposes and compounds, I think we see writ large the importance of social relationships and personal well-being. If ever a time exposed the foundational nature of relationality and challenges to personal integrity and psychological balance, this is it. But also the current period shows just how much we need each other for our well-being and how our intersubjectivity and our internal balance can be challenged so quickly through feelings of isolation or even despair. So I think it would be interesting to see exactly what the radical humanist uh, response to this is, and I'm not suggesting that we would necessarily um, find that out fully today, um, and what it means for a needs-based ethics in practice. So that's really my point. And I think whatever the answer is to that question, it's, it's undoubtedly the case that, that Hartley's given us a proposal and a space to debate both the ethical principles and the practical politics. Uh, and also the book's given us a wonderful resource to draw on. Um, and I just wanted to say as a final point in concluding, um, I've actually just moved house. So I was unpacking boxes this week and out popped welfare ideology and need from 1992. And um, I, I looked through it and I just realized how annotated my copy was and how much I used it. In my, in my social policy teaching. So I'm sure that um, the, the, the new revised edition would be just as annotated and thumbed and used as, as, that, as that was. So um, I hope it's a, a big success and thank you very much, Hartley. Thank you very much, David. Um, Hartley, would you like to take a few minutes to, is there anything that you'd like to respond to or reflect on before we go to questions. Um, I think I will be brief at this stage because it'd be interesting to see what questions are out there. But if I can just firstly say thank you to all three commentators, um, because uh, I mean, certainly I do appreciate the effort made in applying this to the realities of, of issues of social care. Uh, and um, as, as far as um, you know, Ian was saying, um, you leave me with, you know, things to continue to think about. But I mean, particularly, much of what I am saying is indeed addressing uh, or, or providing uh, parameters within which to have that debate about um, theories of value. And um, I do refer at various points through the book to notions of value and, and, and how to actually deal with the sort of new materiality that is emerging. So I was just glad to see the connections that you were making because there's, there's certainly connections with which I'm familiar and, and, and recognize that this is a territory for debate. Uh, and similarly with David, I think you have outlined um, further territories for, for debates, but the whole issue of the sort of intrasubjective, it does indeed point, particularly where you're pointing to the fragility 
the you know the frailty the of, of um, the individual, connecting that to interdependency is is you know fundamental, and I feel hope that that notion of dehumanization, which I have you know looked at various other people's use of that term, um, addresses that to what extent does the the intrasubjective crisis something that flows from um, processes uh, that undermine the essential humanity the fundamental you know integrity of, of the self in that sense and I think that yeah that there is undeniably a lot more to be said about that and I'd be interested to see if there anybody else out there um, is wanting to pick up the same sort of issues to, to actually extend that conversation in a substantive sense but um, shall we see what questions might await? Yes, well, we've got a couple of questions that certainly speak to this idea of um, practical politics as well as ethical principles. So let me give, let me put a couple of those um, and then maybe Hartley, you can respond and our panelists may also want to come in. Um, so first of all, a, a question from an anonymous attendee, and I'm sorry, by the way, people out there that you're not able to put your questions in person because of the webinar format, but I'll do my best to put them for you. It seems that rehumanizing policy perspectives can produce rather uncontroversial outcomes. Greater social good, we can all agree, that's what we want. What are the key challenges that we face actually implementing such an approach? And I'll just give another, an, another one as well for you to, to think about, which comes from Ursula Lelkes. Hello, Ursula. Um, the presented framework resonates with the psychological self-determination theory, which identifies autonomy, competence, and relatedness as core human needs. And this speaks a little bit to Tanya's, um, what Tanya said about uh, evidence in social policy, because Ursula asks, can the needs that you describe be measured? And do they need to be measured? For example, human consciousness. Can you give some examples of how institutions can support meeting these needs. I'm hoping that the other three sort of commentators will, will have views on this and it's not left um, to me to, to defend. Um, yes, but I mean, my, the, the, the sort of exam style question suggesting is this just utopian banality, it, it indeed is a recognition that, um, you know, we're, everyone's in favour of that applehood and mother, mother pie, and, and this is, is uh, potentially, you know, just sort of uncontroversial outcomes is being pleaded for. Um, but in terms of what are the key challenges, I mean, um, one can indeed say, well, let's start with climate change. Um, but I, I think I am sort of pointing to uh, the current, if we're is, is dealing with this on a parochial basis in terms of if we look at the issues um, in current social policy in the UK context, I mean, Tanya has illustrated excellently uh, the particular dynamics that have to be addressed. Addressed. Uh, and the idea of a framework that actually says, um, let's understand this uh, as a process of humanization and rehumanization. Uh, and the, the attempt to uh, commodify or to then de further decommodify the struggle over the commodification, uh, the, the processes by which um, the things that people do, the things that uh, the, the care that is provided uh, to, to other human beings is, is not valued. Um, it, it speaks precisely to those in terms of strengthening um, understanding, in terms of shifting the discourse, shifting the discourse, not necessarily just at the academic level, but uh, potentially at the popular level as well that if there is a, a wider awareness and discussion that thinks about the species as a whole and our interdependencies uh, and what is to be valued in terms of human life, um, that can potentially create a different sort of discourse around some of those fundamental issues, whether it is to do with uh, the, you know, the poverty being fueled by um, our, our benefit system. Um, the, the failures of social care, 
uh, critical issues around how we are protected as human beings um, through the, 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 you know, through the housing that we have. All of these things are, are, you know, can be carried forward and considered in that uh, context. And it's at that point that that issue of uh, measurement, I'm not suggesting that we abandon all the stuff that we do in social policy about the, the measuring of disadvantage, of um, unmet need or whatever it is. We, we need all those, but it is thinking about those in that, that wider context that I'm trying to um, suggest here. And uh, I think, yes, I mean, I, I do actually talk about issues of um, uh, measurement. I do actually talk about um, certainly the self-determination theory uh, because I, the book does review all the main theories that uh, it deals with uh, Ian's uh, and, and, and Len's work, and I, I hope satisfactorily in terms of its the summary of that. But it also summarizes the SVT, the um, social psychologists' uh, approach to need and the way that they they look at those um, uh, you know intersubjective dimensions and all the rest of it, and seek to find metrics to actually deal with deal with those. Um, but my struggle in the book, but rather than simply to uh, review uh, a range of different theoretical approaches coming from different disciplines and, and all the rest of it, and to some extent classify those and think how they are being applied in different kinds of welfare regime, um, that uh, is there an overview, something that can actually unify, unify our critique um, in terms of uh, the future of social policy. And inevitably some people are going to find that banal or half-hearted. Um, but nonetheless, um, I'm reasonably pleased to see that uh, Tanya, Ian and, and David um, do see some mileage perhaps in terms of helping to frame um, debates uh, and maybe then going back to the metrics that we use in the process of driving policy discussions. Um, but I'd be particularly interested to see the extent to which shifting the discourse towards understanding the nature of humanity as a unique species, but also as a highly vulnerable species, can change people's mindset, uh, a, a framing of, of some of those discussions. Um, mm -hmm. but it may well be that Tanya, Ian or David has <coughs> something to add to that. Look at me. Um, yes, well, we, uh, I've referred as well to the uh, eudaimonic psychology, uh, Ryan and DC, and um, self-determination theory, and uh, I think that is impressive. Um, and indeed, they do actually put forward a, a set of uh, measures of, 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 of control, is it, and relatedness and so forth, uh, and do lots of work on that. So I think that that's the place to go. Uh, clearly, if we're talking about measures, we have to distinguish the... the whether we're talking about the really micro level or the super macro level. At the, at the super macro level, we've got the sustainable development goals now, which do attempt to provide measures of need um, applicable to the world, being devised by the United Nations. Um, and then you come right down to um, much more micro measures for small groups, for looking at need satisfaction, the sort of thing that David's been talking about. But apropos David, I, I'm quite happy to say that well-being is is distinct from needs satisfaction, or rather it's much broader than it. Um, uh, there's more to life than meeting needs, and um, the issues that he talked about uh, are is um, concerning well-being. Uh, I think that's a, a valuable, a vital area of research and thinking and care. and. Uh, so I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm speaking. I don't think I have a problem with saying that um, well-being is much more is, is broad a broader notion than, than need satisfaction. So I'd just perhaps just come in on the question that it was I think partly about what are some of the challenges to really implementing such a revised conception of need, and <clears throat> I think that we can shouldn't be surprised to find that effecting change that would be consistent with the radical humanist conception of need that Hartley outlines pretty quickly brings one into 
conflict with, or, or if not conflict, then certainly tension with the dominant economic system, which informs how the market works and almost as a sort of mirror image of that, how the, how the welfare state works. So in, again, in, in the context which I was talking about in my remarks, in fact, the way that need is measured in the uh, most recent Care Act in England has moved quite a long way towards recognising a, a broader range of needs. But that goes absolutely nowhere because it immediately comes, is translated into a set of goods and services and commodified labour. So even where the there are tentative moves, I mean, nothing like as, as fully cool. developed or as um, comprehensive as, as Hartley's conception, but nevertheless, pr some progress towards recognising a fuller idea of a human being um, than simply whether they can walk up the stairs or not. It doesn't, it doesn't translate then into a, a response to that need that actually enables a human, a fully human response, because it is then translated into a system which is still governed by the idea of essentially providing a good or a service uh, or, or a 15 minute visit, as I said. So I don't think we should be surprised by that, but I think it does imply that we need much more um, radical changes to the way that we are aiming to meet people's needs than we've perhaps identified so far. <coughs> David. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, can I just pick up briefly on a couple of those things? And um, yeah, I think, um, I think Tanya's comments are really helpful. Um, and I think that it's quite difficult to see how something like this translates not, not only into a set of policy prescriptions, but even a kind of a politics that takes them forward. But I think one can kind of possibly begin to, begin to speculate. I think a, a kind of radical humanist needs first ethic is not a snappy political snow slogan, really. So I think we kind of need to think what it, you know, what it might entail. And I think that when Tanya talks about the commodification of practically everything, I guess, and particularly in relation to care, I think you can see that in relation to what I was talking about in relation to, to um, psychological integrity and in, in the way in which from uh, new labor onwards, there was this um, focus on um, cognitive behavioral therapy um, as the solution for all um, individual um, psychological trauma. Um, I think CBT is quite effective in some minor uh, forms of, of mental health issues, but, but certainly it's become a kind of panacea for everything. And of course, it's a kind of commodification of mental health treatment because it's, you know, it's behavior rather than analytic and relational. And what we've seen is that the um, a kind of destruction in, in uh, mental health services of relational therapeutic interventions and I think one of the things that it might mean is, is, is that an argument in, in that sphere um, to support interventions and activities which don't commodify people's um, mental health needs into a set of very kind of behavioral interventions. So there's a kind of way into a politics, but I think that the, that's just in one area. But I do think the political question is a big challenge. Um, I think it's a challenge for, for all of us really. And, um, I think you know it'd be interesting to think how to translate this into a set of practical proposals which could be advanced. <clears throat> Great, thank you, um, everyone. Let me let me put a couple of uh, further questions um, to you. The first one is from Katie Colliver. Uh, how would you relate this work on need to the concept of capabilities developed by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum? To what extent do you think they capture similar ideas? So Ian started Ian started to say a little bit about that, but I think there's an appetite to hear a bit more about how uh, that fits together. And I'll give you another one which is different, but so to make sure that we get um, as many people's questions out there as possible from Lee Gregory. Um, and this is about work and the idea of work and valuable work. Tawny 
in the acquisitive society draws attention to the idea of function. And this seems to relate to a broader redefinition of work in society to be inclusive beyond employment. I, I wonder if the COVID context and a focus on key workers provide space to rethink discourse and narratives around more purposeful functional activity. Um, and I, again, Tanya started to talk, talk a bit about this, but uh, again, I think there's an interest in hearing a bit more on that topic. Ooh. Hartley, shall I hand those to you first? You're on mute, Hartley. You're on mute, Hartley. I'll get the hang of this eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that um, certainly Tanya and, and probably David would have more to say than I around capabilities theory, but if I'm to express um, um, a reservation, because uh, I talk quite a lot in the book about um, CERN and Nussbaum's uh, capabilities, but I'm very mindful, for example, that uh, where uh, Martha Nussbaum talks about um, the capability to imagine the suffering of another. I have a problem with that in the sense that is it necessarily something that one has to imagine because the capability theory is very much liberal individualist at root. And the idea of the isolated individual in the sphere of capabilities that Zen talks about has to imagine the suffering of another rather than sharing that. And I, I think that, you know, the whole issue to do with empathy and understanding empathy as a human um, characteristic um, it, it is far more critical to do with interdependency, with sociality. And the notion of sociality doesn't always fit comfortably uh, with the, the notion of capabilities. And I'd be interested to get some feedback from Tanya or, or from David on that. Um, on functional activity, um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think what I'm saying is that one can certainly understand it in, in a functional sense and functional activity is to be valued. Uh, what human beings do um, has a purpose and then often a function. Um, but it's also a question of what functions you actually value and whether the, the function of providing care, for example, the function of artistic creativity, of making music or, 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 or whatever is also to be valued in different ways as something that is essentially human. Um, is, uh, it means we have to totally reconstruct our understanding of what is meant by work if you're going to go down this road. Um, Tanya, would you like to come in? Sure, thanks very much. Yes, and th thanks for both of those questions. Um, so Hartley and I have had long, I think very productive conversations about the relationship between needs, rights and capabilities over the years. And um, my current understanding, but it is something that evolves over time and through discussion um, with Hartley and indeed with, with Ian, in fact, um, is that to, to my mind, the capability approach provides a useful overarching framework, but it is just that, it is just a framework. And in order to apply it or make use of the idea of capabilities, you need some specific content which so it needs adjunct theories if you like additional um uh, uh ways of of filling the content of what your what it is that you're concerned about so some people talk about that as a a capability list or the idea of which things it is amongst the huge range of things that could be considered capabilities or even valuable or even central capabilities which things is it that you're really going to focus on. And to my way of thinking, a, a theory of need is one very productive way to fill that gap, uh, that, that stuffing that's needed in the uh, capability framework or the capability approach, because it gives us a rigorous way of understanding 
what it is um, that we should focus on that should be the, the uh, target of our um, endeavor to um, improve people's lives. Um, and um, moreover, the, the uh, way in which we do that, I think is entirely consistent with the kinds of things that are highlighted in Hartley's uh, exposition of, of uh, the nature of human beings. So for example, the idea of consciousness or critical autonomy, that uh, this isn't a, a kind of top-down exercise, this is something that is driven by people coming together to understand, discuss, debate, struggle for um, recognition and so on. So my, in my way of thinking, there's a, there's a huge amount of synergy between the capability approach and um, this understanding of human need. Um, and I think that the um, uh, capability approach is useful as a, an overarching framework, but needs the kind of stuffing uh, that can be provided by uh, a theory such as this. In relation to the question on key workers, um, so yes, I think there has been a sort of moment of, of realization, as I was saying in my re remarks earlier, that there is a different way of valuing things other than simply market value or exchange value. But again, don't we come up against this same difficulty of how do we then integrate that? So, so the, we already see that this, this recognition that was afforded by everybody clapping at eight o'clock on a Thursday evening has not translated into a pay offer, for example, for nurses. Um, so the, the translation of this newly, new recognition of social value into the exchange value, the market value of their labor has certainly not been direct. So how else, if, if, we, if we think it's not gonna happen that way, how else do we see that new system of value becoming embedded? And, and how can it be given real value and real recognition um, given the dominant form in which we provide recognition and acknowledge value, which is indeed through the market. So I'm not sure how far it gets us, although I'd like to think there was a possibility for an alternative there. Um, yes, briefly, if I may then. Um, I, I agree with, with Hartley completely about the, the idea of capabilities um, kind of as set out by by Salen Nussbaum as being Nussbaum as being kind of related, uh, located in a kind of sense of um, liberal individualism, um, and they do seem to attach to to the individual. And of course, Nussbaum gives us a list, you know, a substantive list of things that that that, that, that do populate that. But I think that the, um, I, I think I believe Hartley's view and and certainly my own is is is. Um, is somewhat different, and I think it's interesting that in um, that one can, if one looks at sort of what we're trying to get at here, which is the the characteristics of the of the human subject, if you like, in a positive social context, it, it's it's actually we can understand it as much in in, in terms of the an ability to um, relate to others in a common life. Um, and, uh, and a shared enterprise as a set of individual capabilities. So I find that the kind of capabilities um, approach is, is, is helpful, but, but rather limited given the framework in which it, which it originates. Um, yeah, I, I've, well, I've spent a lot of time thinking about needs and capabilities, so, and I don't really want to, to, to repeat that here. I think uh, Tanya's answer was, was was very good. I, I, I agree with that. It's a way of po expanding the notion of capabilities or populating it. Um, and it is interesting that in her more recent book, uh, Martha Nussbaum talks more about needs and the language of needs starts to come in and then other discussions of capabilities. But on the second question, I, I was really struck by this, the COVID I impact. Um, and I wrote a short piece in Open Democracy looking at the list of essential workers which the UK government identified as requiring um, education for their children during the lockdown. Uh, and it was a, a remarkable list. Uh, it goes well beyond health and social care on the emergency services. 
It includes farmers, supermarket staff, workers in the utilities, teachers, telecommunication workers, transport, law and justice, religion, social security and retail banking staff. And, and um, I thought how remarkable this is and I, I went back and tried to compare this list with the list of, um, of reserved occupations before the Second World War. Uh, and it's, it's, it's similar but it excludes a whole stack of, of um, industrial and mining occupations which have now just disappeared from Britain and been stuck offshore. Uh, but I, I was struck first of all this, to, to have, to describe some workers as essential or key goes completely against uh, orthodox economic theory. Can't, can't um, think of that or, or alternatively as uh, thinking about some jobs as socially useless to use Adair's terms. Um, that, that language doesn't work. And secondly, as you say, uh, a lot of um, the key workers are low paid. So there's a great mismatch between economic values and social or normative values. Uh, and so I, I was very excited that um, perhaps this was pushing towards, um, you know, a rethinking of, of value, of, of social value. I think that's that's still a battle which is going on. For example, I I can't conceive that um, care care services won't be fairly radically reformed in the next year or two. But I may be wrong on that. Um, but I, I I share your scepticism, Tanya, that what this will actually result in. Okay. Well, let me give you a last couple of questions, probably with apologies to people whose questions may not end up getting answered. But these ones are. I'll take us to slightly different uh, grounds. Uh, firstly, from Lee Wan, how can the politics of species awareness be advocated amidst rising nationalism and increased public backlash towards globalization? And the second one from Anthony Valiant, um, on Nussbaum and imagining, not sharing, suffering, to enable sharing and sociability, presumably people need to see, live and experience some of that suffering to have the empathy rather than ignore it and be shielded in gated communities, private schools, pretending not to notice. So the question is, are there policy ideas you would promote to promote empathy and shared enterprise? Um, Shall I have a go at the first Sorry, one? Can you just repeat the last part of um, Lee Wan's uh, question? How can the politics of species awareness be advocated amidst rising nationalism and increased public backlash towards globalisation? Okay. Can I have a go at that one? Yeah, you, you have a go, Ian. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll go through the panellists first and then we'll come to you at the end, Hartley, so that you can have the last words because this will probably be our last round. Ian. Um, well, I think the backlash to globalisation can be exaggerated. Well, of course, globalisation can, can be anything from um, financial integration to uh, a, a growing sense of our connectivity as, as people on this planet. Um, but I think it can be exaggerated that this uh, the backlash to, to the latter. There's um, uh, there, there are lots of movements around which we we know of, we see. Of young people and others that are expressing a more common uh, belief in uh, humanity and, and global common needs. Uh, and then there's also, um, in, in a re more real politic way, there's greater and growing concern by the elites of the world about the threats of, of climate change. We see this now very strongly. Um, and uh, um, uh, in, in terms of, of finance, there's tremendous, a uh, lot of thinking going on about how to shift funds around the world. Um, and I think we shouldn't, um, we should acknowledge these the pressures, uh, the planetary pressures, which are now leading to greater cooperation on a global scale. We'll see some of this in Glasgow at the end of the year, hopefully. Um, uh, and uh, I think that, so um, I, again, it's a sort of materialist force majeure thing. I think um, we, we shouldn't get to a uh, feeling of hopelessness because um, 
that there are alternative pressures and the, the balance between the two is still to be fought over. That's the first, that's my point on the first question. Thank you, Ian. Um, <clears throat> Tanya and David, do you have, do you want to briefly add anything or you don't have to? <clears throat> well, just very quickly add something perhaps on Anthony's question about um, how do we create the conditions for empathy and shared experience. Um, just to mention that I think this is more difficult than we might imagine and that I'm increasingly coming to the view that we need to reduce inequalities before we can hope to um, create the conditions for more genuinely shared experience and empathy, which of course does potentially present a bit of a catch-22 if you think that part of the reason why people are not more ready to support measures to reduce inequality is because they just don't have that empathy or experience of how the other half lives. The reason I think that I'm coming to that view is partly from the work by Rana Kasberg in Case, who may actually be in the, in the webinar, I can't see the list of participants, I think, but um, who's investigating what actually happens in an uh, area where a mixed income community is being created through housing regeneration, and to what extent, through the lens of particularly perspectives of, of young people, do those with higher incomes and lower incomes in the new housing and the uh, regenerated housing actually come into contact with one another and have shared experiences? And the answer is very little indeed. These people are living cheek by jowl, literally in blocks adjacent to one another, and yet their lives are almost entirely lived in parallel. So it takes a big, and it takes a lot more than simply, um, you know, housing engine or engineering solutions, if you like, in order to create the conditions for those uh, lived experiences. It takes shared institutions. It takes a reduction in the gaps um, in the types of lives people are living, as well as just, for example, geographical proximity. Cool. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and Hartley, I'm going to hand back to you for the for the last word. Last words. Okay. Um, Lee Wan's um, question. I mean, I think to most of these questions, my answer is, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> would that one knew how to promote, to popularise <laughs> some of these ideas. And I, it's not as if I, I hold the key to this, but I would agree to the whole issue. I, I refer to that just at the end of my earlier presentation when I was talking about, you know, the rise of populism, an amoral form of populism, uh, reflected in uh, nationalism, in welfare chauvinism, in um, the conspiracy theories, uh, fake news, everything that undermines the development of human consciousness on the one hand, of, of human sociality on, on the other, as, as being essential and a part of the crisis that uh, we, we, we face. So um, if, if, if anyone has some, you know, substantive ideas that can be, you know, developed, uh, yeah, we need to to work on those. And similarly, I mean, Anthony's um, question is, is something that really does interest me. Um, I mean, in terms of what I'm thinking about, um, in terms of doing next, particularly about unpacking the concept of, of sociality, um, because um, yes, I mean, certainly psychology of, of various, branches, uh, anthropology, biology, um, genetics, uh, neurology, has lots of things to say about the phenomena of altruism, of empathy, um, of, of, of compassion, the difference between empathy and compassion, for example. Um, we can get demonstrations of empathy with superficial clapping for carers. Um, but it's uh, sometimes, it's, uh, who was it coined the term post-emotionalism? I can't remember on the spot. Uh, but the idea we see plenty of public displays of, of post-emotionalism, of a synthetic kind of engagement. And empathy in that sense may be destructive. It makes you depressed. It makes you feel, well, I've got no answers. But compassion is perhaps more important if one is thinking about how to change things and thinking about how to actually change things rather than actually just say how awful it is but if indeed we are sort of engaging with our members of our species and sort of recognizing that we exist as a species um, 
I think it perhaps um, helps us move towards a sense of compassion or even anger, uh, rather than sort of wallowing in sorrow and empathy. But um, anyway, just uh, if that's a passing concluding uh, thought, um, perhaps we can leave it on that note. Yes, uh, that seems a good note to leave it on. Thank you very much, Hartley, and thank you very much uh, to all three of our panellists. It's been um, a, a fascinating and rich discussion, certainly given me a lot to think about. Um, so uh, just what I should have said at the beginning, the book is available in good bookshops near you and online. It's published by Policy Press, and there is a discount code uh, being put into the chat. So... Uh, you will be able to get it at a discounted price. Um, Maria is sharing a, yeah, you, there you go. There is the link and the discount code. Um, so I hope that before too long, uh, many of us will be able to meet again in person. And as Tanya uh, said, to celebrate that, I had completely forgotten that this was also going to be the celebration of, of, of uh, to mark Hartley's um, uh, retirement from the department where he is greatly missed. So I do very much look forward to, to that part of, of the event uh, taking place in person in the future. But for now, thank you very much uh, everybody for joining us and um, have a good evening. Bye, goodbye. <laughs>